when you're an entrepreneur and you're coming out with your first concept, like you, your friends and family, you know, they'll put in risk capital. But once you get your Series A or once you're getting your people, you really are selling your vision. Right? And when it comes to investors, different investors invest differently. So you have to tailor that pitch. What I really uh, hire based off of is interest and what are the core uh, skill sets of an individual and how can I enhance those and leverage those. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Learning of Leaders series. First of all, happy Thanksgiving to our viewers from overseas. And it's a pleasure to welcome today Wakas Al Sidik, a serial entrepreneur and founder and CEO of Biotricity during our business immersion week. I know that we will have students uh, joining us within classrooms and that will be debriefing the session after. So thank you very much all for joining. And without any further ado, I pass on the floor to Peter Van Am. Peter, floor is yours. Thank you, Luke, and it's a pleasure uh, to be with you and also to be with all of you that are joining us from all over, let's say, the EU universe. I know that many of you are watching uh, on various uh, classrooms in Barcelona, elsewhere in Munich and Geneva, and I look forward to spending this next hour with you. This hour, of course, is all about entrepreneurship, and most particularly, we're going to be meeting a fantastic um, entrepreneur, as you said, Look, Wakas, Wakas, I, I could fill probably the whole hour if I wanted to just go over your CV, uh, but uh, perhaps needless uh, to say or, 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 or use, useful at least to highlight is that you are a serial entrepreneur. You've been involved with a startup of at least three companies that um, uh, have done really well. And of course, you're working uh, and right now at uh, Biotricity a healthcare company that I believe has had three rounds of funding. Uh, the last one, a C round, which valued the company at $300 million, a really impressive based in Silicon Valley. Before that, you've done many other things. I think you have more academic degrees than, um, than anyone I know. Um, and also you've worked for some of the biggest names in the uh, technology world, IBM, AMD, uh, just to name uh, two. <clears throat> and Intel, I should add, uh, indeed. So, Wakas, we'll, we'll go over all of the things that you've done. And, of course, we want to make sure that everyone who's joined us is going to be able to get some takeaways for if you are planning for an entrepreneurial venture. I know you're all here for the Business Immersion Week. And, of course, you are uh, looking to build your career afterwards. Wakas, why don't we get right into it? And I should ask, because it is Thanksgiving where you are. You're in the U.S., uh, you know, what can I, what can I wish you? What are you grateful for this Thanksgiving? And, you know, what do we owe the pleasure to, the honor to that you're joining us uh, on this Thanksgiving day? Thank you and glad to be here. Um, well, you know, as I kind of indicate to all my people who know me, the, the holiday time is a very productive time for me. So it's, it's the time where I get quiet and I get to think. So uh, happy to be here. And uh, it's a normal thing for me. And in terms of you know, what I'm thankful for, I think uh, I'm thankful for, you know, uh, the time of the world we are living in. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of focus on creating new ideas and pushing the human race forward. So I think it's an exciting time to be around. Yeah, it certainly is. And uh, you're right, you know, and we know this from our classes and from uh, the reality out there, of course, this idea of the fourth industrial revolution, the idea of sort of the merging between uh, the human and the uh, computer world, almost all the advances that we have, you know, you're working on that with biotricity, of course, but I should ask a first question, you know, we also live in a world, I think last week in Silicon Valley or, or, or around, um, you know, a former entrepreneur, Elizabeth Holmes, uh, who worked in the, the merger between healthcare and technology was actually sentenced to, I think it was 11 years in jail for yeah. you know uh, the deceit that she had created with her company, H how was that received in Silicon Valley, and how is that is that reverberating, let's say, uh, in 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 Silicon Valley, and particularly among the healthcare startups? Yeah, I think in the Valley, uh, people are very very focused on uh, accountability now. Um, one of the things that you know the Elizabeth Holmes thing treated was that there's a huge rah rah around branding and marketing and 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 what you can say and, and kind of essentially the idea of selling 
nothing because that's what entrepreneurs really do, right? They sell a story and they bring in their initial funding and then hopefully that story uh, grows into something and, and becomes a, you know, something tangible that you can touch and feel. And so a lot of the private enterprises now are trying to bring out this accountability aspect, which is then you know, going in and making sure that your uh, finances and in your technology, you have third party verification, people who are industry experts. And I think that that layer of um, scrutiny and that layer of uh, specificity is, is very much a focus for entrepreneurs uh, in the Valley, you know, having that uh, recently transpired. Yeah, and it is really a time of reflection in the industry, isn't it? Because we had, I mean, at least I can remember sort of the era in which like technology was like, you know, the coolest thing, the industry to work in. Everyone wanted to go to Silicon Valley. Um, you know, a lot of companies were very profitable, or at least they had uh, a, a very high valuations. You know, now we're seeing, let's say, a, a little bit more of a, um, uh, you know, not a downsizing per se, but but things seem to be getting on a on a on a different footing now. We saw a lot of announcements of companies sort of finding the right scale, you know, uh, doing away with unprofitable projects, um, you know, and also some of the taglines I would say of Silicon Valley, right? Like before, it was like all about like fake it until you make it. Uh, I'm sure that that's no longer true uh, today. Yeah, no, absolutely. So one of the things that you know we talked about, you know. It, talk about you know tangible data and tangible finances i mean one of the things was in the valley was very much let's buy growth right let's blitz scale and buy growth and forget about the losses and forget about profitability and suddenly growth was not happening uh resources were not as as available capital was not as cheap and so suddenly there's kind of like a refocus on it and then there's certain valuations that were going uh very very aggressive and they've actually uh messed up parts of the industry in the sense that you're spending, you know, $100 to acquire somebody where your actual ROI on that individual or, or, or cost that or revenue from that person is only $80. And the idea is you're going to grow to a certain scale, and then you'll, you'll chop all the expenses. But the problem was that retention rates were not there, right? So this whole idea of, okay, $80 on 100 is great if you can retain that customer. So if your retention rate is 40%, well, now really, you're only counting on $40 in a long term perspective. So I think that these types of um, uh, you know, understanding yep. the entrepreneurial at the early stage and at the medium stage level is become a lot more acute and people are very much focusing on that. And certainly you are focusing on that, right? Because you have a history, of course, both in technology, but also in the finance world, at least in the venture capital world. You know, I want to talk to you about that. But first, of course, Biotricity. I mean, a big success story. Uh, you um, had already various rounds uh, uh, of uh, capitalization where you gathered, I think, uh, around 75 million for this healthcare startup. Um, the main idea is remote monitoring for patients. This is a an healthcare company that sort of brings in technology and brings in the idea of you can do a lot of, uh, uh, of your healthcare from home or from wherever you are. Listen, I, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit, you know, what that means in practice, you know, maybe one or two products so we can see what it what it actually is. Uh, and then I want to ask you, I mean, where do you get the idea for that for that kind of a company? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'll ask the first question. So, you know, Biotricity, we're, we're focusing on remote patient monitoring uh, and, and originally focusing on the cardiac space. Right. So in cardiac. Heart. So, yeah, heart number one killer in the world. And cardiac disease is very interesting because 83% of issues are asymptomatic. And so what that means is you need long-term data. And, you know, 30 seconds is, is the standard, or you have these 24-hour tests that are being done in pretty much every country in the world outside of the United States, but they're not really functionally useful because, you know, again, 83% of issues are asymptomatic. So you need long-term monitoring, but long-term monitoring creates risk, right? Because the patient can have a heart attack, a stroke. You send them off on their own for you know 20 days to to be monitored what happens if they have a heart attack on day 10. so uh we created a platform and then we applied that platform in our first product which is a smart cardiac monitor and so what that's doing is it's a device that's prescribed to you by the doctor we figured out insurance so we're you know medicare medicaid private insurance reimbursable uh, which is very important from a commercialization standpoint but what the device does is you wear it, it's like a small mouse, and it, and it, it makes uh, contact with your chest, and it analyzes your ECG. And anytime it detects an emergency, it transmits it to a call center, they can review that data, and then they can deal with emergency response. So there's, you know, probably about, uh, last time I calculated, about 28,000 people that are alive today 
because of because of our of our product, right? Because three o'clock in the morning they're sleeping wow. and they go into heart failure, and we get them into the hospital and and get them to survive. There's another sixty thousand patients that we were able to intervene early. So uh, there's these things about where your heart stops, but it doesn't just stop instantaneously. There there are those scenarios where it's yeah. instantaneous, but it usually progresses. In many cases. Totally. If you see yeah. the data, you would almost immediately know how serious the situation is. You know, I mean, like, this is so fascinating, but here's the thing that I don't get, you know, maybe it's because I'm not that mm-hmm. smart, but like, well, how do you come up with the idea of creating such a company? Yeah, so I mean, it was kind of, as all entrepreneurs, the roads are quite twisted. So, uh, you know, I did some graduate work. I was working with the NSA and the DOD on remote monitoring of environments. So this one of the applications- these are these are U.S. Uh, official institutions, let's say uh, that yeah. that you know departments of health or or or, US or sub- yeah yeah. So the U.S. military, I was working with them, and I was looking at monitoring environments, right, based on sensor uh, sensor technology. So I was very interested in that. And one of the applications was monitoring individuals, right, to do real time uh, response. So that was kind of an area of interest. And I really like that application. And then I kind of just, you know, got caught up in industry. Got yeah, got went went elsewhere. And one of the issues for me was that I, you know, when you're making that leap for entrepreneurship, I ended up uh, going with the team and we ended up going into another space uh, because I came from the cloud computing space. And then once we exited that, I said, no, I like healthcare. I'm going to do healthcare. And then we started another company called Higgy. We sold that to Babylon Health. And so, then I was finally at the point where I said, I'm going to actually pick the uh, and, and focus on the area that is most interesting to me, because I think that's the big play. Uh, and that's the future. And so I started Biotricity. Is it, you know, you, you've talked, of course, a little bit about your, your professional journey. And we'll talk more about that, that also. But in our preparatory uh, conversation, you also mentioned that, you know, the notion that healthcare is important and that you have to be forward thinking about it and include technology partially also came from, let's say, personal experience in the sense that, you know, in your family, you saw sort of the benefits uh, of having uh, certain monitoring activities for, for, for um, uh, people with certain uh, health uh, issues. Is, is, does that have to do with it? Do you, have, is, do you get your personal passion? You know, the fact that you're working on Thanksgiving, do you get that from like, you know, really caring about something very deeply beyond the financial and the technological possibilities? Yeah, I think the personal thing for me, um, you know, I, I, I talked about it when we, we were uh, talking earlier is that my family, they're type 2 diabetics, a lot of them, and type 2 diabetes has a lot of uh, issues and, and intersection with uh, heart issues. Um, and when you look at the, the diabetes and the heart intersection, you know, generally they say, you know, take an aspirin. But there's really no long term following. How do I how do I analyze? How do I support this patient? Through the, uh, through the basis, right? Because right now when we look at healthcare and I've seen that at least in our family is that they will respond and they will do things once you get diagnosed, right? right. Once you're already at the But edge, that's too late. That's, that's too late already, exactly. And so you get that personal, uh, you know, the, the intersection between, let's I think they call that ikigai nowadays in, 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 in business education, you know, the, the, the intersection between what you're good at, what you're passionate about and what the world needs, I, I think is, is what it is. Um, but of course, you know, the reality is still that you mentioned this, you know, 90% of startups fail. And if you go into the healthcare sector, you know, 99% of companies fail. So, you know, even if you are good at something and you're passionate and the world needs it, you know, you still have a, a very high chance of, of failing. How, how do you get then the funding and how do you know that this is going to be a, a functional business model? So, you know, from my, my perspective, I always look at the commercialization strategy first. So, you know, come up with an idea, come up with a concept, and then how are you going to commercialize? Who's going to pay for this? Why are they going to pay for it? Um, so I've really tried to zoom in on that. And that has helped me um, be a part of, you know, organizations that have been successful and, 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 and avoid that. And in healthcare, that's always not, you know, intuitive, because usually you're like, hey, this is a really important aspect. This is going to help people. Let me go develop it. And then you get FDA clearance. Um, FDA, of course, that- meaning the, the U.S. agency in charge of, uh, you know, all the approvals that have to do with drugs and uh, healthcare. Yep. Uh, and in the EU, it's MDD, right? So, but the issue is that even if you get the clearance, it has nothing to do with commercialization. The two are not tied together. And so then you have this whole other process. So what we try to do at Biotricity, and we've got 
you know, um, four different products. Um, we look at, you know, how are we going to commercialize? Who's going to pay for this? And we figure that out first. So before we come up with any, you know, we put pen to paper on the, on the concept and start actually developing it, we figure out that commercialization strategy. So that certainly is something that has helped me. And, I, and I'm right. a big proponent of understand and making sure that you understand, especially in healthcare, because, you know, you have- It's two- a world on its own. Yeah. You know, it's a very big market, but also it doesn't have the same dynamics as other markets, right? It's not like it's a consumer market. It's a market that's dominated by, you could call it B2B in a way, you know, the yeah. buyers are very often, you know, insurance companies or the, go- the government or hospitals as opposed to uh, consumers. Is that right? No, that's exactly right. And, and that's one of the things that, you know, when you're in the uh, B2C play or you're in the B2B in, in a non-regulatory environment, you can say, hey, this is going to save you money. This is going to be something that is going to improve or, or, or I can find the customer directly. And here there's almost this indirect, um, you know, they always talk about when you're trying to acquire a customer, who are the spheres of influence, right? Well, there's all of these other spheres of influence, which you cannot control in healthcare, right? The regulatory aspect, the clinical outcomes, the, the physician, the nurse workflow. So you've got all of these other variables, which actually make the entire marketplace a lot more dynamic, which is why being successful in healthcare is a lot harder, but also, you know, very, very fulfilling if you actually make it. Yeah, and and certainly it looks like uh, you're successful and uh, congratulations, of course, on all the success you've had so far. I want to take a step back, Wakas, uh, which is what we often do and look a little bit, you know, to the person, the man behind, uh, you know, the successful entrepreneur. And, you know, one of the things that struck me is, you know, you come from Canada, uh, but you already left the country when you were not even, uh, you know, an adult. You left at age 14, if I'm not mistaken, you went to to New York uh, to to study at the university, um, you know what what are what are we missing here? What are we doing wrong? Yeah, so actually, I, I left when I was twelve. Um, I went, uh, uh, but then I started university at fourteen. So we moved to Seattle, and then I, I started university very young. Um, so went uh, two years. I, I did seventh and eighth grade in in uh, Seattle. So I always say I was born in in uh, born and raised in Canada, but I grew up in the states. Right. Because, of course, you know, the, the foundations in terms of high school, university uh, you had in the U.S. And, and also, you know, I, I guess when you start university at 14, uh, you know, you're going to be able to do to get a bachelor and a, and a couple of masters uh, by the time that no, normally people graduate from their bachelors, which is which is what you did. Of course, you, you uh, specialize in computer science, engineering, very technical degrees. Uh, and then I would say almost Obviously, you ended up as your first uh, jobs uh, with companies like IBM and and AMD. Uh, was that just a, the at that point were you just on the normal track? Let's say you know that's you've done computer science, you've done engineering, so the best place to go is is IBM. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that kind of happened in the sense that I was already in engineering, I was already in graduate school, and you know our university did a lot of stuff with, you know, uh, industry and I had a job or an internship before I even graduated. So I think I had my IBM placement a year in advance of graduating. So it's, it was something that it was kind of like, well, somebody gave me an offer. I wasn't even thinking about a job because I had, I was still a year away from finishing and I'm like, okay, well, fine. I'll, that, that's less risk for me. I'll, I'll take a job with, and, and I was kind of already slotted in and then kind of same a lot of that part of that journey was kind of automatic. Um, I, I really kind of, when I, when I went into the entrepreneurial world, I think that that was more controlled by me. Right. So I was at IBM and then AMD came in and just recruited me. So then I, I ended up going to AMD and then the same thing happened with Intel. And then I, I really kind of took control of my career. When and my you left the career. corporate world. Yeah, but, you know, what, what I thought was interesting is that the, those first few years of your careers, I think you had three jobs in less than five years. You know, the, the, your era of working in big industry, let's say uh, IBM, AMD, Intel, uh, was one where your stints were almost um, always less than two years. You know, of course, now you're in the position that you're hiring people. Right. Right. And so I wonder, how do you look at people who change jobs every year or every one and a half year, knowing that you've done it yourself, of course? Yeah. So I I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, changing jobs every year or two years. Depends on what you're trying to do. Right. So if if somebody were to ask me, why did you change jobs? Right. Well, I was doing something very, very specific and, and incredible at IBM, which was 
consolidating server computing into a, a slim design, which is essentially the advent of cloud computing. Right. At AMD, I was working on their 64-bit architecture. So once I completed that cycle and then Intel wanted to do 64-bit, so I went there. So when I ask and I interview people, and I, I do notice if they, if they skip jobs, I'm very curious to understand why. And right. anybody that responds with saying, hey, I went in because I wanted to learn this experience. I wanted to do X, Y, Z. I accomplished that. And then I wanted to move on to the next. That shows me somebody who's ambitious, who's driven, who's got you know, a very laser focus on what they want to do. Um, that is and it's a good sign. That I want to have. Yeah. And in your particular case, you also said that one of the benefits of doing that, of switching every uh, two years or so, is that if you do it the right way, you said you can accelerate your career. Absolutely. So I, I, I'm a big believer of that. And the, the key thing is going in, understanding what you want to do, grabbing that experience. And then what you do is you change jobs. Straight up you're going to make, You won't make a horizontal move. You'll make a, uh, you'll, 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 you'll step up. Yeah. And, and that's clearly what you did. And then that meant that, you know, by the time you were in your mid twenties, I suppose, uh, you were ready for your first job, let's say, in the more entrepreneurial or the finance world. In fact, you started working at a venture capital fund, I believe, in Silicon Valley. This was a venture capital fund, I believe, with, with origins in the Middle East, um, but uh, Gulf Capital. But that opened its office uh, in Silicon Valley by the by the time you they recruited you. Uh, what well, you know, that's of course a big change. I mean, like a lot, a lot of people want to work in venture capital, you know, but but few are, are able to make that jump. What how did you make that jump and why did you make that jump? At that time, what was happening was um, technology, obviously cloud computing was, was, had essentially made its footprint and, you know, being a very heavy technologist, uh, you know, I think the jump that it was easy for me was I was, uh, you know, top of the game on the technology side. And when you're trying to analyze investments, you want people with a deep technical expertise, right? So having that deep technical expertise so when I went into the banking side, I'm essentially evaluating the technology and whether or not the, that investment is, 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 a, is a good investment yeah. or viable. And then, of course, I had this economics and a background as well. So that, you know, helps in terms of having this business uh, slant to things. And it's, it sort of shows that if you want to, you know, build a career in that way, uh, that it really helped. Imagine that it was your goal. Uh, to 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 work in venture capital or indeed to to create your own companies, it's still valuable to build up an expertise, a deep expertise in another field first, because it will help you make that jump uh, to uh, that other sector that you might be interested in going forward. So your technical knowledge, your knowledge of computing, actually was the the, the skill that got you into venture capital. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and I I still believe that even in the entrepreneurial area, you you have to be you, you want to be very, very skilled in one particular area, right? And then you build around that and you fill around that. So, um, and, and if you have that expertise and you want to move into a different industry, there's, a, there's those complementary aspects that you can leverage and that does, that does support you in, as, as you move on. And then the other thing that I thought was interesting, Wakas, is that you also shared that at that venture capital firm, there was actually a buddy of yours from university. And, you know, tell us about that and tell us perhaps also about, you know, the value of uh, creating a network, you know, whether it's at university or in, in, in the course of your career. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we talk about uh once, at least in the U.S., and I'm, I'm sure it's the same thing in Europe, when, when you do graduate work, when you uh, make these friends, you're spending a lot of time, you have the similar problems, but then everybody goes on to their own kind of career path and career journeys. Um, and if you can maintain those relationships or at least are active or somewhat active in that network, um, lo and behold, you'll find them and cross paths with them in a, in a, in a different, uh, you know, uh, limelight. And, and essentially what happened there was that my buddy, they were looking at these deep technical problems and he called me up because I happened to be, uh, you know, very deep in technology. And so that automatically was a, a nice point of connection and it was, a, it was a favor. And then it turned into this, you know, a uh, path uh, from, from a career perspective. And I think that, you know, even today I will lean on or I will reach out to people within my network, people who I went to school with when I'm actually recruiting and because I know yeah. what their job function is. Um, and I know where they're at or their synergies. That's your lowest hanging fruit to pick up the phone because, you know, it's all about who you know, right? 
That's right. And I guess it, uh, it means that our first advice to the students that are joining us uh, all over uh, the campuses is to look left and right, make sure uh, you remember uh, who you're in class with and, 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 uh, and, and make sure to, to stay in touch uh, after your path, paths uh, go, go elsewhere after university, right? This is something that, that really is sort of the social capital uh, that you have in your uh, professional life is perhaps just as important or more important than uh, you know, your, your actual skills, right? This, this is a very important part of success, uh, your social capital. You know, 100%, you know, statistically speaking, and, and I, I, I don't exactly remember where I read it, but you know, feel free to check and prove me wrong, but it was something <laughs> like, I think 70% of jobs are fulfilled before they're even advertised. Right. Um, because, it, and, and it is true, right? Like even, right, you know, we talk about, we've got, uh, before we put a job ad up, the first thing I do is I pull internally within my organization, I talk to people who I respect, who have experience, and I'm like, hey, I'm looking for this type of position, do you know anybody? Right. So, I mean, I know I actively practice it. So if I actively practice it, I know other people do as well. Yeah. And, that, and there's a lot of interesting theories about this, about how you can do that. Um, you know, having loose ties to a big number of people and then having some, some, some better ties or strong ties yeah. to a small group of people, I think is one of those uh, uh, theories, you know, but, but you did really well in venture capital, um, regardless, let's say of your buddy, uh, you know, did, did really well for that company. And, and I guess that must have given you then sort of the, um, the motivation or the inspiration to venture out on your own and to start your own company. Is that, is that what happened next? So what I basically saw was, uh, you know, the, th there's this whole idea when you go into venture capital and what it is. And what I saw was that, um, some of the ideas that were getting funded, I was like, you know, I, I have better concepts than this. So if they can get funded, um, I I, you know, I think I can, you know, this, that's the, um, that's the Kool-Aid we, we um, drink, right. And, and convince ourselves. So it doesn't always work out. Um, but, you know, that was, that was the, the idea because I said, you know, I, I, I did have ideas. I did have concepts and I see that, okay, these people are getting funded and these concepts are good. Um, but I also have good concepts. And so in that, in that area, it helped me actually take that leap, uh, and, and take that entrepreneurial journey. And some people naturally have that. And some people have to kind of see it right. Or, right. or have some sort of catalyst. And that was my catalyst. And for you, of course, you could then combine, I guess, at this point, you're about eight years or so in your career. And on the one hand, you remember all those things that you learned at IBM and AMD and Intel about cloud computing, about, uh, you know, the future of computing. And on the other hand, you know what's happening in Silicon Valley, where the funding goes. And then you actually do this. You find a couple of other people uh, become CTO of a startup. And that startup is called Advanced Technology Lab. And that is a network computing company, isn't it? Yeah, that was a network computing company. It was really focused around, so, um, you know, Citrix, uh, I don't know yeah. how familiar you guys are with Citrix, but Citrix's original thing was applica remote application delivery. And so part of that application delivery is how do you uh, cut down the cost of technology because computers and all this stuff was getting very expensive. So um, the concept around uh, AT Labs um, was about this network computing component, right? So almost going back to like the mainframe world, which nowadays yeah. it's, pretty much what we are. I mean, a lot of the tablets and a lot of the devices we have are a lot less powerful. Um, and a lot of the resources are on the edge uh, edge network side or, or in the cloud side. And so we essentially created a, a an access point and a, and a software delivery mechanism that was similar to, to, to the concept of Citrix, but with the hardware component. Um, right. And then we ended up selling that to Anywhere in the newer was sold to Weiss and Weiss was sold to Dell. So we sold too early, but you know, it was still good. I mean, the 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 sequence there is is interesting, right? Because you said we sold too early. I mean, like to be clear, you you sold the company for 50 million dollars, five zero. So it's not like you know uh, you were left with uh, with a pittance. Um, <laughs> uh, but I guess what you saw afterwards is that that world kept on uh, evolving, and then in right. fact the market opportunity was even bigger than the one yeah. that was seen at the moment that you sold. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And I think that sometimes you make those decisions, but you know, for me, you know, every founding teams are, 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 are funny and, and in the sense that, you know, people come together on a, on a concept because they're all passionate about it, but individuals may have different goals, right? And so, you know, an alignment of goals is very important. Um, for me, I think it was still very good. I mean, I, I just say that we, we exit early, but for me, I, I did want to move on. Like that was right, something right. that I was, I was sort of, 
you know, done with um, because uh, my my personal interest has always been how do I build something that has uh, a big enough impact, right? Can it can right. it really be a standalone brand? Now, maybe you still get acquired, but it's not because the market and the opportunity isn't big enough. And in that particular space, the market and the opportunity was not big enough for a standalone uh, yeah. uh, entity. And that's, of course, something that many startups think about even before they get started is what is my so-called exit strategy, right? Like and yes. very often, indeed, it is to say we're going to try and sell to one a bigger competitor yep. um, because that's probably the easiest way out in many cases. I mean, choosing to, to go at it on your own, of course, may come with the biggest rewards, but also is the hardest route. Now, um, you know, you did actually go on to found another company or to at least um, be active in another startup. Sensor mobility. This is already a little bit more in the area of where you're working uh, right now. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That was more on the uh, IoT sensor side, uh, being able to con- do this connected healthcare uh, concept. Yeah. So you, you you can sort of start to see a, a red thread or a common thread, um, but you could have said there, but also there you told me like I left and I asked you why why you know why did you leave? You know, is, is, did you have to leave? no? And I, and I think you told me, no, it was a gut feeling. I mean, yeah. you know, on the one hand, you're talking about all these market opportunities, you know, what's the rational exit strategy, you know, what's the, yeah. the money that's in it? And on the other hand, you say, you know, gut feeling. Yeah. So that was an interesting time. You know, uh, I was watching the market and, and, and that was very much, you know, so Fitbit was getting very, very um, big at that time. Jawbone, which ended up actually going, uh, you know, belly up. Um but this idea of that fitness was going to take over over healthcare, and so, right. you know, sensor mobility and ended up getting um, um, uh, merged with this company called Higgy, and so I was there uh, with them, and they were originally going hypertension. So the whole concept was we were bringing in the connectivity platform. Higgy was the end consumer. We're going to look at hypertension screening across every pharmacy. And we're going to build this network of of uh, of uh, uh, front end, you know. Uh, screening and, and engagement with patients. And we're going to solve this problem of hypertension. And they got enamored with Fitbit and they said, no, let's turn this into a gamification platform and all that. And I'm like, I just don't think that's the right play. Uh, and so that's right. where uh, I just, when I looked at the FDA and I looked at the rec- regulatory, and I think part of that gut feeling also comes from my, you know, was, was informed from my technical ability and my uh, technology expertise, because when I look at the regulatory, I'm like, this is not easy, right? It, it, you know, getting an FDA clearance and being clinically accurate to what FDA wants, this is not simple. And, and the entire product development pro, uh, uh, process is very different when you're dealing with medical devices versus a consumer product. So I was like, it's going to be very tough for them to jump and, and bridge that gap. And so that's where, you know, I ended up saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. And, uh, and of course you weren't done with entrepreneurship. You know, that's of course the moment that you started, uh, biotricity and, and that sort of, uh, we've now made a circle round in a way and are back at, at the start of our conversation. You know, Wakas, I, I, I have so many more questions for you, but I also know that we've got a lot of students with us today. So I want to, um, invite a few to come on camera and ask, and ask you questions. And perhaps the first one we can start with is Hamza. Hamza, he is originally from Egypt, but doing his MBA, I believe, in, in Barcelona, aren't you, uh, uh, Hamza? And, you know, you're quite interested in that nexus between, let's say, entrepreneurship and, and financing. Uh, is, is that right? Uh, yes. First of all, I want to say happy Thanksgiving uh, to you, all those who celebrate. I celebrate myself as well here in Barcelona. I actually grew up in New York as well. So, um so it's great to have you. But yeah, my question, I know we we talked a little bit about financing. What I'm curious about is, you know, obviously you've got a great track record now. You're in a, a great circle of investors. You're you're well connected. But initially with your first business, when your funds, your family friends funds, when you, you know, you, personally, you could not finance your first business or, or your first venture, how did you get to that next level and how did you do so? No, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think that, you know, hard work is, is you know, always uh, kind of like the starting point of everything, right? So when we were looking for capital originally, um, my analysis that what I did was I looked at all of the companies that were in a similar space or, you know, in healthcare, healthcare platforms 
who were their backers, who, who did, who did they get financing from? What were their structures? And, you know, I went and I cold contacted, uh, figured out within my network, how can I reach them? I would use LinkedIn, like I very, very, you know, aggressive uh, pro, uh, process that, you know, I established, uh, essentially established, but it was very much rooted in, okay, well, what do these guys really invest in and why would they invest in me and what's the parallel, right? So the thing is to understand very, very uh, clearly, you know, the industry that's that you're operating in and who are the other players that have gotten funding? Because the thing is that the stage of funding also changes, right? Some investors won't, won't back you um, in, a, in a series C or a series D, they will only invest in C, right? They'll only invest in series A. So you have to understand the investor profiles and you have to understand uh, uh, the, the, those companies that, that, are, that, are, uh, that have got an investment. And then the other thing that you should do is also look at where are these companies presenting in terms of their investor conferences? Because they're, uh, they're going in and presenting to investors, usually investors that, they, that have funded them or in conferences where they are seeking capital. So a lot of the, uh, that investor community is actually there and you have access to them. So maybe you can't get through to them from an email or a LinkedIn or something like that. But if you can see the investor conference where, hey, you know, you take biotricity example, you know, biotricity is, you know, where's Teladoc presenting, right? And, and uh, right. wherever Teladoc is presenting, most likely I'm either there or uh, we are presenting as well. So th that's the low hanging fruit that you can analyze and, and, and uh, use that as a part of your methodology to seek out a capital. It's it's really interesting. I, you know, I have to think back of this series. I'm, maybe you've seen it. Uh, we crashed about the, the creation of WeWork and its journey. And one of the legendary scenes is of of uh, the founder Adam Newman uh, saying, uh, you know, where's Masayoshi Sanda, so the the the, the big uh, investor, of course, in tech uh, from um, uh, Japan. Where you know, where where can I meet him? Where can I see him? And he found out that he was at a conference in in India, and then he made sure that he was there presenting. And I think that 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 part of that story is true. And and it seems like you know if other parts of that series are a bit bigger than than life, uh, that that idea of being where your you know investor is, that that uh, really does resonate and work in in uh, in the startup world. Would absolutely. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And and it goes same thing for business as well, right? Even as you grow at your other stage, where do you want to build those alliances? A lot of those people will come in and, and attend some of these conferences. And even if you are not necessarily presenting, you can be active there and you can be very engaged because those people are. And there's usually a lot of forums there to support startups and, and young entrepreneurs. So you can also leverage all of that if you don't you know, necessarily have the ability to present, um, you can just by being present and being able to access some of the other round table and the discussions, or there'll be panelists and you'll find some of these investors, you can reach up and you can talk to them. And most of these people are pretty uh, open and accessible in that forum. Right. And, and, and that's something, of course, that, uh, that, 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 that helps that ecosystem uh, survive and thrive, let's say. Uh, I want to bring in Kevin, if that's okay. Kevin, uh, who is on... EU's digital campus. He's joining us from Mumbai in India. And uh, Kevin, you had a question that went more, let's say, into the industry element of, uh, of biotricity about healthcare. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Peter, for introducing me. Uh, hello, Mr. Vakas, and thank you for your insightful, inspiring words. And this is surely going to bring us new perspective uh, towards the entrepreneurship. And my question to you is that according to some Indian healthcare experts, biosimilar is the category that will make the future of the healthcare sector. Since you work in the healthcare sector, I would be interested in knowing your view on this. I would also be interested in knowing what sectors and categories would you focus if you were to start a new company? Okay. Um, two great questions. So let me, let me take the first one because, you know, that's, sure. that's an easier one because I'm always thinking of, uh, you know, different ideas and different concepts. Um, but, you know, biosimilars. So I have seen a lot of this in um, more the Asian and the South American markets because of the cost of drug discovery, right? And the cost of technolo uh, technology discovery. So once something becomes, you know, comes off a patent or once you can create something uh, without having to have this risk of, uh, commercialization and and you don't have to pay a premium uh, or distribute from a from an app from a manufacturer. It's a great opportunity to essentially blitz scale or 
uh, expand and become modern or have access to modern technology in the you know uh, South American and Asian markets. When you come to the North American or the European markets, I don't think that that stands true because at that point, you know, those manufacturers they have to find the next thing, right? They have to push the envelope and they have to innovate. So you know, there's this whole uh, trajectory of how do I catch up as quickly as I can to the, the 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 more developed nations and the ones that are more technologically developed, and that's where you will see a huge, I think, opportunity uh, from a business and from an entrepreneurial per- entrepreneurial perspective in those markets, right? Um, it's still an opportunity in the European and, and in the American markets, but it's you're going to target the lower socioeconomic or the lower um, uh, insurance, you know, so like in the US Medicaid, right? Uh, they, they will use generics, they will use cheaper, uh, cheaper technology. So if you go to a hospital that is very Medicaid focused, they wouldn't necessarily use the latest technology and the latest x-rays and the latest um, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals. So certainly there's an opportunity, but your 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 biggest opportunity is going to be in in the countries that are trying to blitz scale and, and get more technologically advanced as quickly as possible. And in the m- more um, uh, mature markets, you have to innovate because at that point, the dollars, when you look at logistics, cost of goods, um, cost of resources, the ability, you know, just the salaries, it just, there's just not enough dollars left for you to really build a, you know, a, a, a huge business out of it. I mean, maybe you can do it in, in certain sectors. So that's my opinion on that. Right. Um, in terms of new companies. So what I'm very interested in right now is, um, uh, basically growing organs and really looking at the intersection of, uh, you know, DNA based uh, uh, delivery and, and, and very genetic oriented uh, delivery of, of care, right? So, you know, there's this whole idea of, you know, if I take my genome and let's say my arteries are too thick, right? So I have a propensity to have a heart issue, not the case, but let's just say, um, so that's really bad if I'm eating potatoes and burgers all day long. Um, but if I eat carrots, I really have no risk, right? So um, my genome is not necessarily adapted uh, to, to take on these burger and this, this potato diet. But as long as I'm staying away from it, it doesn't really affect me, right? So, you know, how does that take a play and how does that play into better outcomes on the patient level, right? So I'm very interested on that because you're going to find people that have actually really bad genetics, but they're so much healthier just because of their lifestyle choices. And that, you know, goes into that, you know, what are the choices that we make on a day-to-day basis and how does that impact? And then of course, the other thing, uh, uh, and then that goes into that second piece of, okay, if I know the genetic, can I actually build and, and manufacture an organ based on you know, because we can now uh, 3, uh, 3D print uh, proteins, 3D print um, uh, uh, cells, something that is not going to have uh, a rejection, right? An organ rejection issue. So that's an area of interest that I'm always following and, and analyzing right now. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating to hear you talk about all the opportunities that exist. And, you know, you get the impression that how, how does the brain of a serial <laughs> entrepreneur uh, work? Um, you know, if we take the other, the opposite side of that coin, you know, we've got a question from Vicente, Vicente Correa. Um, and his question is, you know, if you look at not the upside, but the downside, you know, what's been for you the most difficult thing that you've come across, you know, in life, in your career, but also perhaps in starting a business, um, you know, let's say the, 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 the hardest thing you've come, come across rather than the biggest opportunity. Um, so the hardest thing for me, I think is that there's always, so you go through these stages of growth, right? And, um, so I I would say the hardest thing for me has always been, uh, human resources, right? So finding people that are passionate and is engaged and is interested, um, in the problem that you're trying to solve. It is very much um, something that you essentially get drunk off of, right? So finding people that have that same type of interest and engagement is is actually quite difficult, right? So once you have your founding team or your core core people, um, you want to grow, and 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 finding that growth and finding those individuals, you you essentially have to expand the expand the business and finding the right people is uh, is not as simple as as you realize. So you know we talk about the great resignation. 
Yeah. I have very strong opinions about, about that. I don't think it's ever changed for, you know, hyper growth, uh, high intense innovation. And you notice, you know, you left companies. So, you know, like it's always been a competitive market. Exactly. It's always been a competitive market if you're trying to find that th those players that are really, really engaged. And that's never changed for me, right? Um, right. Because the people who are, you know, um, going out there and they want to build a career and they want to be somewhere for 10 years and five years, those are not really the people that I'm, I'm after. But, I mean, but how do you overcome it, though? Because if it is a hard challenge and it will always be and it always has been, uh, you know, and you notice know from your own experience, like the longest that any company could keep you was two years. So like, you know, like, I mean, like, how do you overcome that challenge? So what I have realized is um, find people who are interested, right? And don't worry about whether or not they, they are the perfect fit for the job, right? Um, now, that stands true for most cases. Once you get to a certain scale, there are certain jobs that just they, you just have to find somebody and they have to have that skill set, right? Like if you're, you have 200 people working for you, you need an IT person, they have to be an IT person, they have to have certain job functions. Sure. But outside of that, what I, what I really uh, hire based off of is interest and what are the core uh, skill sets of an individual and how can I enhance those and leverage those? So there's no, so I, I do a lot of thinking exercises when I interview, uh, when anybody interviews directly with me, I go into some stuff that is very, very specific and tangible to understand their thinking. Then I go into abstract reasoning. Then I go into, you know, something that is, uh, you know, something that can be measurable. So I'm looking at non-measurable skills and measurable skills to really understand how does this person think? How do they handle problems? And I'm more interested really in dynamic personalities that are, of course, intelligent, but um, I'm not really hung up on, do you actually have that exact skill set for the job that I'm looking at? Because I believe right. that you can grow into that and you can learn. Well, this is what caused, I think you're in luck. You know, there's uh, over 200 students here that are exactly the kind of profile you're looking for. So uh, watch out because you're going to get a lot of applications. Um, you know, I want to turn now uh, to Era, uh, Era, who's uh, uh, Albanian, but studying in Munich. Uh, she's doing a, a IB international business uh, bachelor there. And she has a question, I think, uh, Era, uh, about, let's say, you know, work-life uh, integration, work-life balance. Yes, thank you for introducing. Um, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. But my question is, like, because I've noticed, like, from the beginning of the webinar that uh, you are a busy entrepreneur. Like, what do you do to handle your busy work schedule, like, what do you do to stay concentrated on your tasks and to be more productive? Like, do you have any tips for us? Um, okay, Lo loaded question. So I'll, I'll, I'll think about that in, in a few different ways. So um, I, I, I think that individuals that are, you know, obviously high stress, high uh, uh, intense uh, and a lot of tasks. So what I try to do is I try to compartmentalize things um, and try to really look at, okay, what are things that are dependent versus non-dependent? So that's how I organize my tasks, things that I can accomplish and I can move very, very quickly on my, on my, uh, on my own. Um, and I deal with those and I don't let them really affect. And it's easier said than done because you really have to have, you know, a, a, you have to be, I guess, aware of yourself and your emotions. So I think self-awareness is very, very critical um, and understanding uh, which tasks you're dependent on other other people for, right? And then based off of that, I really base things on timelines. So if I'm giving a task to somebody, I want to know what date are you going to deliver it to me by? If that date is good enough, I will let you handle it and I'll work with you. If not, I'd rather do it myself. I also really focus on efficiency, um, efficiency of my time, more importantly. So there, it's funny, I was having this discussion just I think last week or something, I was in, actually I was in Germany and we were talking about coordinating schedules and things like that. And somebody was like, well, you know, just give me your, your secretary's in, uh, information, I'll coordinate. And I'm like, I actually really prefer to schedule stuff myself because I think it's a waste of time for me to explain to my secretary and then have her schedule it. Unless there's five people involved, what I have found that if you just email somebody and give them three times, 95% of the time, you'll get a schedule. So what does my secretary do? She does really important stuff for me. That is, you know, I'm looking at a new market for a product. I want to know all of the top players in that space. She'll do a market analysis for me. She'll figure out who are the right people, go into my LinkedIn, figure out who I'm networked with. 
and then come back to me and say, hey, these are the people that we should reach out to that are in those places. So that's a lot more meaningful for me than right. for her to schedule a 12 o'clock call. So, you know, I think that that efficiency, you have to learn where, what tasks do you want to do yourself? What tasks do you want to hand off to others and become efficient? And then the last piece, um, you know, I'm, I'm a semi-professional polo player. So like, that's something that is like a break for me. And you have to find something that is, that really forces you to disconnect. I had that, I had a big difficulty with that. Um, polo like is a distraction? Like, like a, a distraction. distraction. Yeah. Exactly. But an all-consuming distraction. It's very important, right? Because I'm always multiplexing. I'm a horse. I can't really think about anything else. So, Like you know, hiking you to- or swimming or something that yeah. really requires something you to focus. Really- Exactly. Something that really requires you to engage that you're, 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 and, and it's a true disconnect, right? And you can kind of connect to it and disconnect and it gives you an hour and, and, uh, you know, that's your, your way of kind of decompressing. And what is it for you, uh, Wakas? Uh, what are some of the activities that you find really work well for that? I, I play a polo. So that's my, um, that's my activity. Very cool. Uh, you know, and it's also a question that we got from Ravindra, I suppose, as a, as a follow-up question. Uh, who asks, you know, could you tell us a little bit about your daily routine? You know, what, uh, uh, how does your day look like? Obviously, you wake up and you come join us because uh, it's, I think, 8 a.m. for you right now. Yeah, so, I mean, my, my daily routine, uh, you know, I start usually, you know, I'm up around 6, 6.30, depending on how late I go to bed. Um, so I, I kind of work. Um, so uh, uh, up until, I'm in the office by about 8.30, so. 6, 6.30, so I've got about like an hour and a half, which I'm doing email. So first thing I do is, I, of course, I check all my emails. I do all that. I, I throw out all my East Coast stuff right in the morning. Um, and then I uh, get ready for my day. Uh, and then I do email and breakfast. That's, you know, my, my thing. Get to the office, continue on. Um, usually have a late lunch because I don't, again, it's like an efficiency thing. I don't like to drive during traffic uh, or, or grab lunch where I have to like look for parking. It's just an extra so I, I, I will always eat a little bit later. Um, so there's less people, less, uh, less busy. And then uh, work until probably about seven o'clock, go home, have dinner or go out for dinner, depending on what I'm, what I'm doing. And then, uh, then my evening shift starts. My evening shift is usually between 9 p.m. Uh, to about you know, midnight, one o'clock. Uh, and then it continues. Saturdays, Sundays, I'll sleep in, um, I, which is not, I mean, I don't really sleep in. It's like eight o'clock uh, or 7.30 is, is kind of a sleep in for me. Um, but, you know, it's very much, uh, look, to build something, you know, and I, and I know some of the questions that people ask and, and I, I were, you know, how do you balance to build something? Right. There's, you know, you don't. Unfortunately, there, you, there's no balance, right? Like, I don't mean to be. You go all in. You go all in. It's 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 to build something. That's what it takes. It's not to, you know. I mean, people can tell you and and tell you otherwise, and they can sugarcoat it. But the reality is, um, it's if if you really want to build something from nothing, it does take. It's not a nine to five. It's not a nine to five. It's an intensity. And by the way, if you want roles at companies like that, that's one of my interview questions when I interview right. people who are going at at top level management. And I'm like, listen, I think you're great. I think you you're great expertise, but please understand what you're taking on right now. Right. And, 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 you take it on. and that's, of course, the mindset that you see with, with the top entrepreneurs like an Elon Musk, for example. You know, a lot of us may not understand, like, how can he sort of force people to be hardcore? Um, but in reality, if you have that startup mindset, then at least for that phase of a company, that startup phase, you know, you just, you know, and it's not about hardcore negative. No, you're passionate about this stuff, right? Like, it's, it's hardcore, but it's in a very positive way. Yeah. And, and I think also it's important because it's also by lead by example, right? Like if you want, right. um, if you want somebody to, to put in that passion in that time, you have to show that yourself. Right. And I don't think, I don't think anybody in, in my company can ever, uh, yeah. you know, I'm the first one. In, I'm the last yeah. one in. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, lead by example. Maybe one more question about that, you know, uh, which comes from Raphael and also from Michael or Michael Yao. Um, they ask you about who influenced you in, in creating the uh, startups, uh, you know, wanting to take that step in life. And also, you know, how you found people to go with you on that journey, you know, your startup founders, co-founders. 
Yeah. So, you know, the journey itself and, and, and what made me, you know, I think I, I mentioned that, that it was a catalyst at the, at the investment banking side. Um, but also, you know, my father was a businessman and I saw him build, uh, he was in the real estate space. Um, so, you know, I, I, and as technologists and as engineers, I think also when you become an engineer, like, and, and I don't know how many engineer, uh, background students you guys have but like a big part of the technology uh, uh you know education is you know talking about ideas what is this tech company doing what is that tech company doing and as we know you know the last you know 20 30 years have really been innovation through technology companies so i think that you know being an engineer having you know family that also uh, you know had had experience in business kind of molds you in a way where you're thinking about oh you know what if this and what if that and then of, of course that that uh my, my career was was the secondary uh, or the tertiary right. catalyst for that and then in terms of finding other people you know uh one of the things is that when you're an entrepreneur and you're coming out with your first concept like you your friends and family you know they'll put in risk capital but once you get your series a or once you're getting your people you really are selling your vision right it is very much right. a, a sales pitch um and people either connect with that or they don't connect with that and if they connect with that that's essentially how you find your founding founding people sure and it's not really different from you know whether you're hiring your founding team or even your executive level management mm. or your investors, you're always looking for the you're same. Selling, yeah, you're, it's the same concept, right? You, there's this vision that you're trying to trying to uh, uh, put out there, and and you're trying to uh, get people to to understand and and buy into that. Um, and when it comes to investors, different investors invest differently, so you have to tailor that pitch right. if you want somebody. And, and you'll tailor it naturally, right? If you're finding somebody for marketing, right? If I'm trying to hire somebody who's like a really engaged in marketing, I'm, not, I'm going to be talking about the impact of marketing in healthcare. I'm not going to be talking about the impact of technology in healthcare. That's of course. Sure. You know, and I, I, that's maybe a good bridge because actually we have somebody that's doing marketing uh, that is going to ask the last question. Uh, it's Tuong. Uh, who's from Vietnam, but uh, she's also in the Barcelona campus. So maybe you can, you know, uh, you see this as a as an as an interview. But actually, the question is going to be asked by Tuang. So uh, Tuang, go ahead. Thank you. So first of all, thank you and congr congratulations on like by our heart being listed as one of the time bad invention of 2022. And you know, from my research, by our heart have a very good price for patient. But you know, due to the new technology involved maybe upgrades might be costly. So my question is, what staff startup, especially how can startup can take to ensure the future development remain affordable uh, for the users? Thank you. So how do you keep uh, your products affordable, you know, in a market that, uh, you know, I suppose upgrades are constantly needed? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think I'm the, probably like the worst person to ask that question for because I believe in the democratization of healthcare. So I, purposely focus on like reducing costs. Um, but I think one one area that that in, uh, people can really dr help drive costs is focus um, on retention rates, right? So if you have a really, really good retention rate, um, so at Biotricity, we have a 98.8% retention rate. So 98.8% uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, retention rate uh, rounded up. Based off of that, I know that that customer is going to stay with me. So because I know that customer is going to stay with me, I can actually, you know, amortize the cost of new technology. So I can, you know, give right. them new technology away or discount it heavily because I know they're staying with me. So retention rate can really, really support your ability to drive innovate. costs down. Yep. Yeah. And innovate because you know that, okay, it's not the upfront cost it's, it's the long-term cost. Now, in our case, what we did was in healthcare, things are, they'll put a Holter monitors. I've, I've seen them being sold for $3,000, which is insane. A lot of money. Yep. A lot of money. So we analyzed it and we said, well, you have a $300 connector um, because it's got low attenuation on, on and, and uh, it's, it's got better conductivity. So there's less noise. Well, we're just going to improve the algorithms and we're going to improve all of that. And we're going to take that bomb of, you know, maybe it's in 
a thousand dollar bomb and we're going to bring it down. I, I think our bomb is like $87 or something. So wow. we're going to completely crush that bomb and, and, and get rid of all of the expensive items that we can. So that's another area that when you're looking at, if there's a hardware component or there's a software component, be very, very aware of your cost of goods sold. So, you know, one thing that I always look at is a sanity check is look at other companies in the space, right? So we look at a, right. uh, you know, other companies, medical devices in the space. And I see that their COGS are, you know, 70 to 75%. You know, our COGS are 40 to 45%. So, you know, automatically that gives me 30% room. And that also gives me better access to technology, uh, better ability to give access to technology to, you know, uh, to everybody, right? And, and, and make it more accessible. It, I think it's rather fascinating that, you know, you say because of the fact that you want to have a long-term relationship with your clients, you actually, you know, that allows you to amortize innovation and expenses. And it's actually the opposite of wanting to drive prices up. It actually is the, the opposite uh, value, let's say. Uh, Wakas, I, I certainly understand after this hour why you're so successful because, you know, the knowledge and the wisdom that you've packed into just 60 minutes is really something, you know, unbelievable. So I, I wish we could spend more time with you, uh, but we know you got to go and, uh, and do your meetings now, uh, or at least, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, be productive is, is what I heard, the productive day, Thanksgiving. And I want to thank you uh, for spending this time with us. I think we all learned a lot. We've got a lot of takeaways and uh, we can't wait to join you either as an entrepreneur or uh, indeed, uh, you know, as uh, working for one. So really thank you for your time, Wakas. And then I hand it back over to look in Geneva. No, thank you uh, for having me. And it was, it was a great conversation and uh, appreciate all the questions. Thank you very much, Wakas. I, I joined Peter in, in, his, um, in his gratitude. Uh, I think it has been an amazing learning from our, from our students. Uh, we want to congratulate you as well on everything you, ach you have achieved and, and wish you the same type of success for all your future endeavors as well. And if you're once around in Europe, feel free to, to come on campus and we'll be happy to host you as well. So thank you very much. Have a great day ahead. I hope it will be as productive than this session has been for us. And uh, we look forward to, to meeting you in the near future. Thank you very much. As for the students, the next session from Learning of Leaders is going to be in the new year. We will be welcoming the country manager of Black Rocks uh, in Switzerland, Ms. Mariam Stab bisang So we're really looking forward to this one. In the meantime, have a great evening. Have a great remaining of the Business Immersion Week. And uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, all soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.